I had a friend, and I've told the story many, many times. At the age of 11, she She had an uncle, and the uncle was doing things to her. She didn't know how to deal with it. And she went to her mother, and the mother didn't believe her. She went to the father. There was the father's brother, so the Father snapped at her and slapped her. So she had to live with this pain alone. You know, going back to Diana's question about grieving, I don't know how someone grieves the loss of their own innocence at such a young age. Then she came from, I think, Afghanistan. She came to Washington, New York. And the only thing that she knew was that she needs to have, she needs to have young men fall in love with her, and then she would leave them. The only thing that she knew was to hurt people. And she got really, really tired of always being alone, inwardly. She would bed people, but she could never really be close. And human beings desire intimacy, not just physical, but just... There's a part in us that desires trust and faith and love and... And she could never experience those things. And she got really, really disgusted by herself. At the age of 27, she got married. She got married for one reason, not that she was in love. She got married because she thought that the institution of marriage, traditional Afghani marriage, will eventually put an end to her trauma, that she can kind of put the past behind her and move. But every time she was intimate with her husband, the only image that came forth was the image of her uncle for five years. You know, she said the only way that I could survive those moments was be disembodied. Just you know, just lay in bed like a corpse. And then once in a while, I would kind of check in on my husband. Are you done? So I can go to sleep, something like that. And then something strange happened to her, which was one day as she was getting ready to perform surgery on someone, she ran into a brand new intern. You know, she had never seen him before. And it was one of those magical moments that happened to some of us, which is you just see someone, you say, I know him, I feel him, I want him. And because she was married, because she came from a traditional background, she didn't allow herself to pursue him. So she avoided him. She called her boss and said, I can't do the surgery today. 
But one day, uh, as she was done with, you know, performing a surgery, she was washing her hands. All of a sudden, this man comes in, and she's washing his hands to go into surgery. And uh, they say hello, and that was it. A week and a half later, you know, they were intimate. It was the first time in, I think, 20 years where she was able to be with another human being, body, mind, and soul. But that was only because of this fatal attraction. Um, she had found herself deeply in love with this man. Her history vanished because of this experience. Uh, she divorced. Her husband didn't know what had occurred. But one day she goes home and she says, I, I'm, I can't be in this marriage anymore. And she goes somewhere and you know, gets her room. And her, her husband, her parents, his parents, they're all trying to figure out what the hell is happening. But you know, it was a secret that she revealed to no one. Um, eventually, the papers that you know, she filed for divorce, the papers came to her house, and she waited for about six months to sign them. She eventually did. In the meantime, this intern looks at her and says, I have to go back home. Go back home. We need to go back home. I'm going back to Los Angeles. What do you mean? I got to go. And he left. Within, I think, two weeks, she lost about 50 pounds. She couldn't get out of the house. She couldn't work. Uh, she was on drugs for a little bit just to cope. So what do you have is a 20-year history. She doesn't understand the history. She can't face the history. She kind of just push it in the closet somewhere. Magic comes into her life for only a short while. And the problem with magic is that it doesn't give you any understanding. It just gives you an experience so intense that your past temporarily just gets paused. It's no longer playing in the background, you know? You don't gain any maturity from it. Nothing really happens to you. You just kind of just forget. So how do you remove this experience from this young woman? What do you do with it? Because now, you know, you have two problems. First is what took place at the age of 11. The second is at the age of 32, where she fell in love. So she can no longer trust love either. You're dealing with, you know, it's like an Everest of an issue. You know, someone must really, really like you. And must be okay with your rejection day after day after day after day. And things stay casual for many, 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 many weeks, if not months. Until something about you just says, maybe I can be a little bit more casual with him or her. For the first time, you begin to feel and understand and experience human intimacy. But it's not like you run towards and embrace it. There's a good amount of fear all of a sudden that appears. Um, that, you know, I trusted my uncle. 
I trusted myself in marriage. I trusted this other guy, but they all failed. I am beginning to trust this guy. I'm not going to do that. You know, because the truth is you don't want pain. You don't want to get hurt again. So you're rejecting uh, more crudely, more fiercely. And you need to be with someone who basically, for lack of a better word, you know, that person just has no ego, is willing to take your abuse over and over and over again because their task is to set you free from something. Um, you know, you kick him out. He stays away for a week and he calls you back. Then on the phone, you reject him. He says, okay. So be on a break, calls you back after a month. You say, okay, let's have pizza. But now you have to start from scratch spend many more times uh, together, more conversation. Again, you know, something about this as well. If I keep rejecting him and he keeps coming back, maybe you know, he's different than others. But this is just being around someone. You haven't even told him your secrets. You haven't even, you know, been physically intimate with him. Because these are just horrendous things to kind of go through. Uh, you have no idea what their outcome is going to be for yourself or for this other person. Um, you know what a jackhammer is? I have one of them downstairs. Maybe one morning when you're here, I'll show it to you. It's this huge, powerful thing. <clears throat> But you can jackhammer uh, an experience out with someone. And you can jackhammer brand new experiences into someone. It just doesn't work. Uh, in some ways, I think when you're dealing with like a foster kid, you know, who's been tossed around for most of his life and all of a sudden you want this kid to love you. But there is so much hurt and there's just so much abuse. <clears throat> and emotional abuse that's involved that, you know, as, as someone who's adopted this kid, the first thing that you need to understand is you're going to be abused. As a potential parent, step-parent, this kid is going to abuse you for at least 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You know? Um, and then once there is this opening then slowly you begin to insert the good stuff that you have inside you, inside this other person. You know, one of the, one of the really, really good movies that, that kind of slightly uh, expresses this theme is Life as a House. It's a really, really good movie. You know, you have a kid who hates his father. And the father goes to the mom and says, I just need this kid to stay with me this summer. And the son says no, but, you know, eventually he goes in there. What the son doesn't know is that, and he hasn't told anyone, the father, so he's got cancer. You know, they're fixing up his house. The father takes the abuse from this kid uh, and the son slowly kind of warms up and helps him and they're not really really close and one day he goes and washes his face and he opens the medicine cabinet and he sees this bottle and he looks at him it's for cancer and he confronts the father he says is this yours yeah are you dying yeah so you're leaving me again and the son gets really, really pissed. And he says, you did all of this 
so that I can like you again? And the father says, no. I did all of this so that you could love me. You know? And these are just remarkable stories and remarkable, I think, insights as to how you remove toxin from someone and then you replace it with like a garden of flowers. And it's to some extent the story of Abraham that's told in the Quran that, you know, they tie him up and they're about to burn him. But despite all the fears, despite the prospect of death, Abraham remains steadfast in his belief and his faith. And eventually God transforms, you know, this, this um, hellish environment into a garden of flowers and Abraham just breaks free and goes away. You know, there are a couple of things. If your history works for you, it works for you. If you're able to uh, even deceive yourself to make the history work for you, there is nothing wrong with it. If, on the other hand, you come to a place where you recognize that the history just is not working for you, the narratives are just destroying you from within, the way you think about things, the way you feel about things, you need to kind of find yourself in this stage of helplessness. But the truth is, I don't even think that's enough. And this helplessness forces you to kind of go out there and look for someone who can help you. Okay. Now, you're going to enter, you know, this person's space, whether it's a therapist or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, very, very cautiously. You know, it's like the story of uh, uh, Robin Williams and Matt Damon. What's that movie called? Goodwill Hunting. You know, he's got no mom, he's got no dad. But he's a genius. And what's keeping him back is the fact that he trusts no one. He loves no one. And, you know, Robin Williams and him are sitting in, in his office, in William's office, because he's a psychologist and he doesn't say anything. Because he knows that the first move must come from this kid. He can't initiate the conversation. You know, because the kid is smart. And one of the things you need to understand is people who have relatively negative history inside them, they're immensely clever. You know, they know how to survive. They will lie, they will cheat, not in a bad way, but their survival skills, emotional, physical, you know, it's really, really great. You know, it's like, I get students who say, I'm like, uh, what is it called? Surf couching? You know? I mean, you have to be a genius to go to a stranger's house, live on their, in their house environment, live in, you know, sleep on the sofa, open the fridge, go use the restroom, take a shower. You need to be immensely comfortable with invading other people's space and being okay with that. And then even being friendly, even though you're in their space, you're like, it's invasion, you know, of somebody's space and then you're okay with it. You laugh it off, you buy them pizza, you do this, you do that. And so it becomes very, very tricky because, uh, you know, they deceive you in thinking that they trust you, they have faith in you, but that's actually not the case. Over the many years of surf couching emotionally, they have learned how to become really, really good friends with people, at the same time backstab them as well. You know? And that's how you survive. So there are lots of things to overcome. You know? uh, I think when we were talking in the class about the story of Socrates and Plato, is that Plato has nothing inside. He's got good parents. He's just ambitious like all 19-year-olds. He doesn't really have trauma. He doesn't have like a long history of failed relationships or a failed life. Uh, 
in many ways, his life is quite successful. It just that there is that attraction that he has for Socrates. And then he eventually embodies Socrates, you know. Uh, and it takes about seven to ten years, I think. Uh, you know, you can find the same stuff in, I think, the story of Carlos Castaneda. Even daughter of fire. I mean, what, what can a teacher really do? He can't do anything. The only thing he can do is just wait for an opening. Irina is open, receptive, bicep goes in there, you know. Uh, sprinkle some seeds and then Irina says, get out and says, fine. You know, then she's angry, she's depressed and she's lonely and she laments and she screams. And my savage is very patient. Not patient in the sense that he just looks the other way all the time, you know. But once he knows that she loves him, he screams at her, slaps her, spanks her, you know, kicks her. But eventually what happens is her faithlessness, her doubts, her rationality, everything gets replaced by the stuff that lives inside my side. But it's a seven-year process. You know, and the thing you need to understand about that book is that it's a very, very, very focused relationship. You know, she, she doesn't have very many options out there. It's not like she can go away for like five weeks or two years or five years. She can't read any other book. She can't get into a relationship. It doesn't work that way. And that's how change happens. You know, my father was 27 when he got married to my mom, who was only 15. 15 years old are impressionable. You look at my parents, my mom thinks exactly the same way that my father does. You know, my father injected his own history, his own passions into my mom. And that's how things work. You know, imagine if my dad was 50 and was to marry my mom who was 40. There is established personality there. How the hell do you get rid of it? It's very, very difficult. It's not a, it's even impossible, really. I mean, the only thing that a 50-year-old and a 40-year-old can really have in common is they both enjoy having chicken tikka masala for dinner. That's it. They have nothing else in common. at the risk of sounding ridiculous. Uh, no, I really think the emotion we talked about earlier, that's, that's the only way things will work. I think love just gives you, even if it's delusional, it gives you superhuman powers where you're willing to sacrifice everything and anything. Your sense of morality changes, good and bad changes. Everything about you changes the way you see things. You really become the soft clay in the hands of this other person. You know, um, it has many dangers, but if you happen to have fallen into the right hand, you know, it can be very beneficial. You know, it's a great savings account to have. You know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Brian was a kid. He was just like a, you know, a long hair. And he used to wear like tank tops and shorts. Not even loose shorts, tight shorts. You know, to my classes. And once, you know, a few times he would come to class drunk. Uh, is that true? <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and, and he takes a few classes and he disappears. I don't know where the hell he goes. He goes partying and dancing. And he does music with these losers. And it's bad music. 
and he even dared to give me like copies of his, his music. And I'm, you know, putting them in the car and it's loud and it's obnoxious. But what the hell? This is not music. I have no idea what this is. And, um, you know, and he just sits in the classes and something about him just changes little. And, uh, they interact more and he spends time at the house more. Now he's doing his PhD, he's a completely different man, at least on the outside. I'm not quite sure how things are within. I mean, some things about us will never change, you know. But even if you have some, I suppose, negative stuff inside you, this other part of you that has reached some level of maturity is able to tame, domesticate. They can't be removed, you know. You will forever dislike your father, you will forever dislike your mother or your brother or your teachers or the priest, whatever the case may be, you will dislike them. <clears throat> but you give yourself options of having different perspectives. And when you catch yourself, you know, feeling angry and you grab a perspective from here and you impose it on this emotion, all of a sudden things begin to change. And that's really the only thing you can do. You know, you can't forget, you can't change the person who's hurt you, but you look at the experience differently. Sometimes, when you, you know, catch yourself and find that you have the resources to do that. You know, there are times that I'm giving the kids, you know, a shower and they're screaming, shouting, breaking them. And, you know, I run to the garage and grab my hammer. It's a big, heavy, run back to the shower. And Yusuf is so screaming, lifted to hit him on the head. And I look at Yusuf and I go, he's only four. What else can he do besides screaming? But the fault is not his, the fault is mine. I have forgotten what a four-year-old life really is all about. It's about just breaking from the strong thing, having no mercy on anyone or anything. And then all of a sudden I put the hammer back and grab ice cream and you're both like having ice cream in the shadows. And that, that's how it happens once in a while where you catch yourself. You know, it's not like someone can go inside you and yank the bad stuff out and so that you could forever be blind to them or never see them. So that's not the way it works. You just manage it differently. <clears throat> you know, it's not like you could all of a sudden be without desires. You just desire different things. But it takes a lot of work. You know, in many ways, really, it's like uh, bulldozing a house because it's just rotten. And you clear everything out and you go to Home Depot, grab some two by fours, and you build it up again. You know, if you look at, if you look at, a lot of things in life. Uh, in a few minutes, you're going to sit in your car and you're going to drive. Everything about your car submits itself to you. Your bed submits itself to you. That's why you can use them. That's why you can exploit and take advantage of them. It is in their submission that they become useful. You know, if the car was to say to you, I don't want to go anywhere right now. That's a bad relationship to have. Because the car remains silent, because it remains submitted to you, you can do whatever you want with it. You know, you wash it, you take care of it, it takes you home. Human beings are, I think, the only creatures, for the most part, who have difficulties submitting themselves to something that's good for them. 
you know. Um, I don't think it's an easy process. And a lot of things need to come together you know, for you to be thawed and then We have a saying in Persian that Mahi o Har Mughaz Abbigiri tells us that when you catch a fish, when you take it out of the water, for sure it's going to be a fresh fish. In other words, it's never too late. It really isn't. At any age, you just need to be at the right place, amongst the right people. The rest is a piece of cake. Yeah. Diane, I'm sorry you look tired. Ryan, you look exhausted. Jenning, how are you? I know Carolyn wants to say something, but Jenny, did you have? You sure? Okay. But you know, you should read books, read good books. Uh, just read books. I don't know what good books are about. Um, you know, if you, for example, read books that all feel like Daughter of Fire, then your thinking just becomes like that. Your vocabulary changes. Your Emotions begin to change, your desires begin to change. That's another way you can do it. You just keep reading the same stuff. Just knock on doors until one opens. <laughs> 